Unleavened Bread Ministries presents Sovereign God for Us and Through Us by David Eels. Narrated by Brad Moyers. Hello, friends. This is David Eels. Over the next few weeks, I would like to share with you this book called Sovereign God For Us and Through Us. It's going to be narrated by Brad Moyers. And uh, it's just full of testimonies of signs and wonders of people who have come to the revelation that the plan of Jesus was to be in his corporate body what he was in that individual body except around the world that is doing the works of his father and i'm quite sure that you're going to enjoy the testimonies and enjoy the over 2,000 verses that are in this book that are referenced and probably many more that are not referenced and i think it'll be a great blessing unto you thank you so much for joining us god bless you we now continue with chapter 4 of Sovereign God, For Us and Through Us, by David Eels. Jesus, in teaching us to cooperate with God's purpose of crucifixion in our lives, said, Resist not him that is evil, speaking of men. However, we are commanded to resist the devil, speaking of evil spirits. We should never get caught up and wrestle with flesh and blood. Jesus would not. Isaiah 53 verse 7 says, he was oppressed, yet when he was afflicted he opened not his mouth. As a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and as a sheep that before its shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. We are to wrestle with principalities and powers. God wants us to see evil people as victims of Satan and the curse, vessels to be pitied. Luke 23 verse 34 says, And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God wants us to see through those vessels of evil and see him. Jesus had peace because he believed in the sovereignty of our Father. Jesus knew where all power comes from. John 19 verse 10 says, Pilate therefore saith unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to release thee, and have power to crucify thee? Jesus answered him, Thou wouldest have no power against me, except it were given thee from above. Eli rebuked his sons for their apostasy. 1 Samuel 2 verse 24 says, Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord was minded to slay them. They did not repent because it was in the mind of the Lord to slay them. The purpose of the Lord is still ultimate. Many will not repent because it is in the mind of the Lord to slay them for their evil. We could justly receive the same treatment, but God gave us grace. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, For by grace have ye been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Only God gives the gift of faith to believe and repent. We have to go to God. He grants faith and repentance for ourselves and for those around us. True understanding of salvation by unmerited grace causes us to fear God. We have all known of those who did not value the gift of God only to have it taken away and given to one who does value it. The Jews lost out to the Gentiles. Revelation 3 verse 11 says, Let no man take your crown. The self-righteous ones flirt with catastrophe. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7 says, For who maketh thee to differ? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? But if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? If we have anything more than our neighbor, it is a gift of God, not any cause for pride. Sovereign God, For Us and Through Us, by David Eels. Chapter 5, God's Sovereignty Over Time and Election. I have declared the former things from old. Yea, they went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them. Suddenly I did them, and they came to pass. Isaiah 48, verse 3. Predict means to tell the future in advance. What the world calls prediction rarely comes to pass. It seems they have a warped idea of what a prediction is. When God predicts the future, he declares it and then does it. 
Not only does God's word show the future, but also it brings it to pass. The worlds, which is the Greek word ages, have been framed by the word of God. Hebrews 11 verse 3. The word framed in this verse means to make complete. The history, or his story, of all ages was completed before the beginning. Isaiah 48 verse 4 says, Because I knew that thou art obstinate, and thy neck is an iron sinew, and thy brow brass. Therefore I have declared it to thee from of old. Before it came to pass, I showed it thee. Lest thou shouldest say, Mine idol hath done them, and my graven image, and my molten image hath commanded them. He is a jealous God, according to Exodus 20, verse 5. He will not share his glory with the idol of self or an idol of man's creation. See Isaiah 42, verse 8. God receives glory from telling of his works hundreds or thousands of years beforehand. His works were finished from the foundation of the world. See Hebrews 4, verse 3. Because his works were finished from the foundation of the world, no one can say, My might, my power, my God has done this. It is important to God that we know he is sovereign. Our God has done something that no other God has done. He accurately tells the future long before it comes to pass. It is hard to live the Christian life without knowing that God is sovereign. Without this knowledge, we will not have the peace, rest, and the fear of God that we need in the midst of trials. We will always be wrestling with people and circumstances and trusting in our own strength, instead of seeing God's hand and trusting in His strength. Hosea 4 verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Isaiah 46 verse 8 says, Remember this, and show yourselves men. Bring it again to mind, O ye transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. God does all of his pleasure so that only his counsel comes to pass. The proof that God is the only God is that he declares the end from the beginning. All the prognosticators, psychics, seers, and stargazers of the devil have only come up with slightly better than random accuracy on the future because their Lord is not sovereign. The devil does have an edge. He knows the prophetic word better than we do, and he predicts what he plans to do. But God is sovereign and often overrules him. Isaiah 46 verse 11 says, I have spoken, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed, I will also do it. God is very self-willed. He has a right to be. His self is not corrupt, but ours is. He brings to pass what he desires because it is right. In the text, God is speaking of Cyrus, the pagan king of the Media Persian Empire. God raised up Cyrus to destroy Babylon in order to set his people free from bondage. At that time, Cyrus had no idea that the Lord had put the desire in him to do exactly what he wanted. Isaiah 44 verse 28 says, That saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure. Even saying of Jerusalem, She shall be built, and of the temple, Thy foundation shall be laid. How can God be so sure that a man who has been a pagan all his life will do everything that will please him? We see here that nothing or no one can resist God's good purpose for his people. God is sovereign over the future of the great empires of the world in order to deliver and prepare his people. Isaiah 45 verse 1 says, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, to open the doors before him, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee, and make the rough places smooth. I will break in pieces the doors of brass, and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness, and hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that it is I, the Lord, who call thee by thy name, even the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel my chosen, I have called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. The Euphrates River passed through the city of Babylon. One of the gates spoken of here crossed in the Euphrates River to keep the enemy out. Cyrus, by the help of God, performed a monumental feat in diverting the Euphrates so that his army could enter the city beneath this gate. After they had entered the city, they discovered that the gates on either bank leading into the city had been left unlocked by God in verses 1 and 2, which was strange considering that the Babylonians were at war. After Cyrus conquered Babylon, the high priest showed him these prophecies and more that were written about him hundreds of years before he was born. The Jews say Cyrus was very impressed to see his name and works written in prophecy before the fact 
and became a believer in the God of Israel. God stated clearly that he was going to open those gates for Cyrus to do his will. After hearing these revelations, Cyrus knew that God had empowered, planned, and made his way. Christian leaders have turned God into a mere prophet. They say that God sees into the future and then reveals it. Every type and shadow in the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New Testament to prove that God sits on the throne and that one mind rules over time in the future. If there were one loose cannon, things would not be so. According to the law of geometric progression, one change at the beginning makes an immense change as time goes by. Chance or more than one in control could not possibly bring to pass what we see. The Armenian thinkers teach that God predestines and predicts by seeing into the future, then telling you how the dice rolled. Predestined means to determine destiny before it happens. Foreordain, which is the same Greek word, means to ordain an event before it takes place. Ephesians 1 verse 4 says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blemish before him in love, having foreordained us unto adoption as sons through Jesus Christ unto himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. You who are manifesting sonship by bearing fruit have been chosen and are being drawn by God. Romans 8 verse 29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also foreordained, or predestined, to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God foreknew and decreed all who come to the likeness of Jesus, but not the apostate. Foreknew here does not mean that he looked into the future and saw what would be. Foreknew here means to know before, and is not connected with actions or events, but persons. God knew these people before the foundation of the world because he does not dwell in time. God conceives and knows what he creates before he speaks it into existence, just as we conceive and design something first in our mind before we make it. New speaks of intimate knowledge. For instance, Adam and Eve. Jesus will say to those who called him Lord but do not do the will of the Father, in Matthew 7 verse 23, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, from the foundation of the world. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. To the foolish virgins who had not the oil of the Spirit, Jesus said, I know you not. The ones that God intimately knew he foreordained before the creation to be conformed to the image of Jesus. God is creating us through his gift of faith in the word in us. This is the people on the narrow road. This is grace. Romans 8 verse 30 says, In whom he foreordained, them he also called. In whom he called, them he also justified. In whom he justified, them he also glorified. We see here that all who are foreordained will be called, justified, and glorified. They will not fall away, but will bear the fruit of Christ. Are there others who are called but not foreordained? 2 Timothy 1 verse 9 says, Who saved us and called us with a holy calling. Notice that only the saved are called. Called is from the Greek word kaleo, which means to invite. Called is an invitation given only to God's people. For more proof, see Hebrews 3 verse 1, Hosea 11 verse 1, 1 Timothy 6 verses 11 and 12, Matthew 25 verse 14, and Romans 1 verses 6 and 7. To partake of his heavenly benefits in Christ in order to bear fruit. Those who bear fruit 30, 60, or 100 fold will be proven to be the chosen or picked. Naturally, if at harvest time you have no fruit, rotten fruit, or unripe fruit, you will not be picked. The called are the vineyard of God. See Isaiah 5 verse 7. The chosen are the much smaller percentage who bear fruit. See Isaiah 5 verse 10. Matthew 22 verse 14 says, For many are called, but few chosen, which is the Greek word eklektos, meaning elect. The called can fall, but the elect or chosen will not. Hosea 11 verse 1 says, When Israel was a child, then I loved him, and called my son out of Egypt. The more the prophets called them, the more they went from them. The Lord saved those that ate the lamb and were baptized in the Red Sea. He then tried them in the wilderness to see who would be a believer in the midst of trials, and only those entered in the promised land. Jude warned the called of this very thing. Jude verse 1 says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are called. Verse 5 continues, Now I desire to put you in remembrance, though ye know all things once for all, that the Lord, having saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Notice that the called were saved, but some did not continue in faith and were destroyed. Friends, God is not looking for what we loosely call Christians, but believers or disciples as they were called.
Jesus gave us very clear examples of his servants who are called, but do not come and partake in order to bear fruit. Jesus shared a parable in which a king made a marriage feast for his son. Matthew 22 verse 3 says, And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden, which is the Greek word called, to the marriage feast, and they would not come. They were full of excuses, a farm, merchandise, etc. Matthew 22 verse 8 says, Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they that were bidden were not worthy. Even one who appeared to come did not have on a wedding garment, which implies putting on Christ, see Romans 13 verse 14, or putting on righteousness, see Revelation 19 verse 8. Matthew 22 verse 13 says, Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him out into the outer darkness. There shall be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few chosen. A few of the called are chosen or elect because they bear fruit. Matthew 25 verse 14 says, for it is as when a man, going into another country, called his own servants, which is the Greek word for bondservants, and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his several ability. And he went on his journey. Obviously, the man who went away was the Lord, and his bondservants are his people. Two of these example servants brought forth fruit of the talent given them. See Matthew 25 verses 20 through 22. But one buried his in the earth. He used his talent for the earthly. See Matthew 25, verses 24 and 25. When our Lord returns, he will say, And cast ye out the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There shall be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, verse 30. The Apostle Paul, who said of himself that he was called in Galatians 1, verse 6, also said, But I buffet my body, and bring it into bondage lest by any means, after that I have preached to others, I myself should be rejected, which is the Greek word reprobated, in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27. There is much more proof that the saved and the called can fall. See 2 Peter 1, verses 9 through 11, 1 Timothy 6, verses 11 and 12, Hebrews 3, verses 1, 6, 12, and 14, and Romans 11, verses 1 through 7, and 19 through 23. Friend, you probably know if you are called, but are you chosen? You must be diligent in your walk of faith to prove this. 2 Peter 1 verse 10 says, Wherefore, brethren, give the more diligence to make your calling and election, or choosing, sure. For if ye do these things, which are the attributes of Christ in verses 5 through 7, ye shall never stumble. For thus shall be richly supplied unto you the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God at the cross has already given us everything that we need to bear fruit through faith. 2 Peter 1 verse 3 says, Seeing that his divine power hath granted unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that called us by his own glory and virtue. Faith in the promises in the midst of trials will give us the fruit. 2 Peter 1 verse 4 says, Whereby he hath granted unto us his precious and exceeding great promises, that through these ye may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world by lust. The called have the power and the opportunity. The called and the chosen, or foreordained, use the power by faith and take the opportunity. The only ones who will ultimately be with the Lord are identified in this verse. Revelation 17 verse 14 says, These shall war against the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they also shall overcome that are with him called and chosen and faithful. Notice that the called that are chosen will be faithful. I did not make these verses up. They are the word of God. Those who have eyes and ears will see and understand, but the rest will justify their religion and ignore the scriptures. Before time and the future, God sovereignly spoke the end from the beginning, bringing these things into existence in time. Some would argue, how could God make a promise to all of his called and then not keep it for those who do not bear fruit? Every promise in the Bible is useless until someone walks by faith in it. Our part of the covenant is faith. God's part is power and salvation. We can break the covenant through unbelief. Numbers 14 verse 11 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me? For all the signs which I have wrought among them. I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and will make of thee a nation greater and mightier than they. Notice that God is saying to his own people who do not believe that he would disinherit them. Lest any believe that God cannot make a promise and then take it back when they do not walk in faith, pay attention to this. 
Numbers 14 verse 23 says, Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that despised me see it. Surely ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear that I would make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua the son of Nun. And ye shall know my alienation, which is the Hebrew word for revoking of my promise. Unless we mix faith with God's promises, they are void. Hebrews 4 verse 2 says, For indeed we have had good tidings preached unto us, even as also they, God's people, but the word of hearing did not profit them, because it was not united by faith with them that heard. The Israelites who walked in sin were disinherited and blotted out of God's book. Exodus 32 verse 33 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. The same is true of the Christians who did not overcome sin. Notice what the Lord said to the church. Revelation 3 verse 5 says, He that overcometh shall thus be arrayed in white garments, and I will in no wise blot his name out of the book of life. They will be rejected from the body of Christ. Revelation 3 verse 16 says, So because thou art lukewarm, and neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth. God's people Israel were broken off because of unbelief, and Christians who were grafted in but do not walk in faith will be too. Romans 11 verse 20 says, Well, by their unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by thy faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, neither will he spare thee. Behold then the goodness and severity of God, toward them that fell, severity. But toward thee, God's goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Those who are still grafted in at the end are called all Israel, Romans 11 verse 26 says, And so all Israel shall be saved. Those who are still in the book of life, still grafted in, are the elect, which is the Greek word chosen. Romans 11 verse 2 says, God did not cast off his people, which he foreknew. Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election, or chosen, of grace. A remnant is the ones who are left. Notice that they are foreknown and chosen. Sovereign God will have those who are truly His. Abiding in Christ is where salvation is. Some say God gave us the gift of eternal life so He cannot take it back. In Galatians 3 verse 16 we are told, To Abraham were the promises spoken, and to his seed. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So the promises were given to Christ, not to us individually. The only way the promises are ours is if we abide in Christ. Abiding in Christ is bearing fruit. See John 15 verses 1 through 6. Walking as he walked. See 1 John 2 verses 3 through 6. Believing the same teachings given by Jesus and the apostles. See 1 John 2 verse 24, Jude verse 3, and Matthew 28 verse 20. Not adding or subtracting from the word. See Revelation 22 verses 18 and 19. Not walking in sin. See 1 John 3 verses 5 and 6 and keeping his commandments. See 1 John 3 verse 24. In Christ is the only place we can claim the gift of eternal life. 1 John 5 verse 11 says, God gave us unto eternal life, and this life is in his Son. God does not have to take his gift back. His people walk out of it. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18 says, Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. When you walk in willful sin, you are not abiding in his body, for in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. 1 John 3 verses 5 and 6. For instance, fornication, spiritual or physical, takes away the members of Christ and makes them members of a harlot. See 1 Corinthians 6 verses 15 and 18. Only Christ and those abiding in him are chosen. Ephesians 1 verse 4 says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Only Christ and those abiding in him are going to heaven. John 3 verse 13 says, And no one hath ascended into heaven, but he that descended out of heaven. The manna from heaven, the word, Jesus Christ, who takes up residence in those who love him, is the fruit that God is coming to choose. By this time, I am sure some are thinking that they do not measure up. We must first abide in Christ by faith, accepting the gospel report that, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I that live, but Christ living in me. And that life which I now live in the flesh, I live in faith, the faith which is in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Galatians 2 verse 20. 
Those who walk by faith that they are dead to sin and Christ now lives in them are accounted as righteous until God uses that faith to manifest righteousness in them. Galatians 3 verse 6 says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned unto him for righteousness. We will discuss this good news and its fruit more fully in later chapters. God does not dwell in time, but eternity. He sees the beginning and the end at the same time. Therefore, he can answer a prayer before we pray. We do not have to worry that we have waited too late to pray because he can have the answer coming long before we ask. Isaiah 65 verse 24 says, And it shall come to pass that, before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. I had a friend who went to the local trade school offer to take my broken washer for the students to work on. It was only going to cost me for parts. By faith, I told him to go ahead. He called back in a couple of days to say that he would be bringing it back and the cost was $90. My wife and I accounted that we only had $40. In a moment of inspiration, I pointed my finger at the mailbox and said, $50 is coming in that box today. In the mail that day was a letter from a brother in Maryland. I had absolutely no foreknowledge of this incident. He wrote, It is after midnight, and I just cannot get to sleep until I obey God and write this check for $50. I looked at the post date on the letter and discovered it had been lost in the mail for a whole month. Obviously, God had it found at just the right moment. He had it coming a month before I spoke those words of faith. He merely used me to bring to pass what he had already planned. I asked God to do something that I believe he may have changed time to accomplish. Many years ago, this very young girl made a mistake and tested pregnant. As I prayed about her situation, a thought came into my head and right out of my mouth. I asked the Lord to make this girl as though she was never pregnant. I believe that this did not come from my mind, but God's spirit. Because of the way this prayer came, I received it as a confirmation from the Lord that it was the will of God. Later, tests proved that she was not pregnant. I do not know what God did with the baby, but I am sure he is taking better care of it than that girl would have. Nothing is beyond God's ability to help us, unless it is beyond our faith. How can God change his mind when he knows and speaks the end in the beginning? Then changing your mind makes you a liar. Isaiah 46 verse 10 says, Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. If he sees all from the beginning, why would he ever need to change his mind? God will not change what is written in his word. Psalms 119 verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. His word is likened unto a rock, immovable and unchangeable. However, God can change or delay what he speaks to you personally as a warning through prophets, dreams, visions, or through his spirit. In the case of a delay, when the word ultimately comes to pass, it will be fulfilled as and when the Bible says it will. God gave us an example of this in the book of Jonah. Jonah cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown, in Jonah 3, verse 4. God told Jonah to preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee, in Jonah 3, verse 2. So he did. He was not a false prophet. God spared Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, because they repented. This angered Jonah because Assyria was the mortal enemy of Israel, and the prophets had already been prophesying that Assyria would conquer rebellious Israel. He wanted them to be destroyed for what he perceived was Israel's sake. Jonah knew that if he preached to Nineveh and they repented, God would not destroy them, so he fled. Jonah 4 verse 1 says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying, when I was yet in my country? Therefore I hasted to flee unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, and repentance thee of the evil. God spared Nineveh around 752 B.C. so that Assyria could conquer the northern ten tribes of Israel around 720 B.C. and then Judah around 701 B.C. Nineveh ultimately did fall around 612 B.C. God knew before he threatened Nineveh that he was going to spare them for the purpose of using them to chase in Israel. From Nineveh's perspective, they changed God's mind by repenting, but from God's perspective, he changed Nineveh's mind and fulfilled his plan from the beginning for them, which was to chase in Israel. Jonah's Hebrew word for repentest here is nakam, meaning to sigh, and by implication, to be sorry. In itself, Nakam does not admit evil doing, or even a change of mind, only sorrow. 
As father, God must do many things that he sorrows over. When the scriptures speak of God repenting, it is for our perspective, because it appears to us that he changed his mind and did not want to do what he threatened. As a parent five times over, I have done this many times. The difference between God and us is he plans and sees the delays and repentances from the beginning. Numbers 23 verse 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. 1 Samuel 15 verse 29 says, And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Here is something else that is interesting and also proves the sovereignty of God in time in the future. It also proves that God plans delays or repentances before they come. Israel and the United States share a unique identity. Each was entrusted with the gospel in their respective time. From 887 BC, Israel was at war every 17 years for a period of 15 cycles until 631 BC. The United States also has been in a war every 17 years for a period of 15 cycles, from the forming of the 13 original states to Granada in 1983-84. to For both nations, in the 6th and 10th cycle there was no war. The only possible exceptions to the parallel are that Israel appears to have had a devastating famine in the fourth cycle instead of a war, and there seems to be no record for a war in their thirteenth cycle. The cycles could be more exact than our knowledge. Either way, no sane person could think that this is chance. The repetitions of history clearly show that one mind is in control of time in the future. Sovereign God, For Us and Through Us by David Eels Chapter 6. God's Sovereignty Over the Fall and Salvation No man can come to me except the Father that sent me draw him, and I will raise him up in the last day. John 6, verse 44. Some parents feel very guilty that, though they did the best they could, their children seem to be going the wrong way. The following teaching is not against those who have faithfully served the Lord from their youth, but rather for those who feel that the Lord has passed them or their children by. Walk by faith for those wayward children, not sight. Believe in your prayers, expect miracles, but be patient. God has a plan that starts for them long before their salvation. Give some deep thought to this. It will free you from worry, strife, condemnation, and self-effort to bring about God's will in them. They will have to be saved after tribulation and failure of their worldly expectations as we were. Children who are raised knowing about the Lord are sometimes very self-righteous. They think they deserve what they have and do not understand grace. They will also have to see themselves as sinners in order to be the dirt that can receive the word and bear the fruit of Jesus. God only saves sinners. We have all been one. This is a necessary revelation in order to appreciate the great value of salvation and to be saved by unmerited favor. I remember my oldest daughter when she was three years old going around our lost friends and relatives saying, God does not like that. She was quickly deflecting what he had taught her. We thought, you little Pharisee. Our Heavenly Father has had many prodigal sons just as Jesus' parable shows, but that does not make him a bad father. See Luke 15 verses 11 through 32. In this parable, the good son who never left home was self-righteous, judgmental, and merciless. On the other hand, the younger son, who spent his inheritance on riotous living, realized his low estate and came to his father very humbly, saying, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight I am no more worthy to be called thy son. In Luke 15, verse 21, the once rebellious son now understood mercy and grace and was a much better man for it. Prophetically, the firstborn son who never left the father was the righteous among Israel, but they did not understand grace. The younger, second son of the father who fell away through the dark ages for 2,000 years is the church who is returning in these days to understand the grace of God. The father said to these, Bring forth quickly the best robe, meaning the robe of righteousness in Isaiah 61 verse 10, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, which is the symbol of authority in the bride, and shoes on his feet, meaning the walk of separation from the world, in Luke 15 verse 22. The prodigal son will have more of everything than the first son. Those who have been sinners know their need of God, but many times those who are raised as God's people do not. Matthew 21 verse 28 says, But what think ye? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented himself and went. And he came to the second and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir 
and went not. Which of the two did the will of his father? They say, The first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye saw it, did not even repent yourselves afterward, that ye might believe him. Many times it is not the son who says he will go to work in the father's vineyard who actually goes, but the son whose first inclination is to rebel. This rebel who comes to see himself as a sinner goes while the other son who feigns righteousness does not. Many career Christians are bored with the work of God and are distracted by the allure of the world. The publicans and harlots are so appreciative of a place in the kingdom that they throw their whole heart into it, willing to be servants rather than be served. They understand the great value of the gift of grace that is given them in their own unworthiness. In the last days of the Gentiles, it will be the same as it was in the last days of the Jews. There are many self-righteous Christians today who are not the creation that the Father desires. Those who have been raised in the church should humble themselves to the Word of God and not religion so that no man takes their crown. See Revelation 3 verse 11. It appears Jesus had this in mind when he shared this parable. Luke 18 verse 9 says, And he spake also this parable unto certain who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and set all others at naught. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as the rest of men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I get. But the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be thou merciful to me a sinner. I say unto you, this man went down to his house justified, which is the Greek for accounted righteous, rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be humbled, but he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The self-righteous child who kept all the religious traditions was not accounted righteous, while the poor sinner who was repenting of his unworthiness was. Jesus told the Pharisees that he had not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. He was after those who knew they had been sinners to be his children. Look at the following verse carefully. Romans 11 verse 32 says, For God hath shut up all unto disobedience, that he might have mercy upon all. God has designed that forgiven sinners become his sons. Those who have been disobedient have a great appreciation for mercy and grace and do not offend God quickly. God has subjected us to this fallen creation for the purpose of a higher creation. Romans 8 verse 20 says, For the creation was subjected to vanity, meaning the fallen corruption, not of its own will, but by reason of him, God, who subjected it, in hope, which is the Greek word firm expectation, that the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. The children of God can only be created from the fallen creation, and God is the one who subjected them to it to humble them. The scriptures show us our unfaithfulness and unworthiness so that we might have a reason to truly repent. Galatians 3 verse 22 says, But the scriptures shut up all things under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. God chose us to be saved in Christ before Adam even fell. Ephesians 1 verse 4 says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blemish before him in love. He knew we would need a savior before the world was made and Adam fell. He knew the fall would happen and he went ahead with the creation anyway. From this you can see that the fall was in his plan. Children who are raised with Christ many times take him for granted and do not really understand grace. God has a plan for them that may involve the temporary lifting of his grace that has been taken for granted. Do not fear this or walk by sight, but continue to believe God for them. Peter was Jesus' little one whom he raised up to be a disciple. He self-confidently declared to the Lord that he would never be offended and deny him, but would go with him to death. See Matthew 26 verses 33 through 35. God hates self-confidence, but loves God-confidence. So how does God deal with this sin? 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12 says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Failure is the best treatment for self-confidence. Luke 22 verse 31 says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan asked to have you, that he might sift you as wheat. But I made supplication for thee, that thy faith fail not. And do thou, when once thou hast turned again, establish thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, with thee I am ready to go, both to prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, until thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. 
Jesus prophesied failure for this proud man. Jesus, who had authority over Satan, did not forbid him from sifting Peter. Satan sifts to get what belongs to him. In this case, it was Peter's pride, self-righteousness, and self-confidence. What fell through the sieve was what God wanted, the humbled Peter. The sifted Peter, who had turned again or been converted, could now establish the brethren. Before this failure, he would have been a good Pharisee. Luke 7 verse 40 says, And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, the Pharisee, not Peter, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Teacher, say on. A certain lender had two debtors. The one owed five hundred shillings, and the other fifty. When they had not wherewith to pay, he forgave them both. Which of them therefore will love him most? Simon answered and said, He, I suppose, to whom he forgave the most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And turning to the woman, he said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thy house, thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath wetted my feet with her tears, and wiped them with her hair. Thou gavest me no kiss. But she, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but she hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Big sinners make big saints, for they know the value of grace. According to the previous verses, God wants people who are forgiven of their many sins and saved by grace, so that they love and appreciate Him much. This is the creation that he wants, not Adam before the fall. The creation that springs from the last Adam, Jesus Christ, is the ones who have fallen and then are saved by grace through faith. We need not worry about our children or loved ones becoming sinners. Just hold fast the confession of your hope that it waver not, for he is faithful that promised. We must gracefully sow seeds of truth as we can without frustrating them. They cannot be convinced without grace. God works all things after the counsel of his own will, and a man can receive nothing except it have been given him from heaven. And no one comes to the Son except the Father draw him. God will do it when the time is right, and he will use our faith because faith is the substance of the thing hoped for. We can see why sometimes God does not save people until they are a little older and have tried the world and found it wanting. However, if you have faithfully served the Lord from your youth, you have a great reward. God can save anyone any time he desires. It is important that we not try of our own works to save the lost, but first honor God's sovereignty with our faith for him to do it. John 6 verse 37 says, All that which the Father giveth me shall come unto me. Verse 44 continues, No man can come to me except the Father that sent me draw him. Father will draw everyone that he chooses to Christ. God chooses us and gives us a desire to come to him, and only then do we choose him. Psalm 65 verse 4 says, Blessed is the man whom thou choosest, and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. God sometimes chooses the worst in our estimation. If God can save Paul or Mary Magdalene, who had seven demons, he can save those we believe for. Do you remember the conversion of Saul who persecuted the saints with a vengeance? Acts 9 verses 3 through 5 says, And suddenly there shone round about him a light out of heaven, and he fell upon the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. A monkey would get saved with such an experience, which was totally at the discretion of God. This same omnipotent God says, All things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive, in Matthew 21, verse 22. God uses his gift of faith in us to manifest the salvation of those he has chosen from the foundation of the world. Pray and thank God for those salvations. I can hear someone say, Goody, we will believe God to save the devil. That will solve a lot of problems. I do not think such faith would endure to the end since faith is a gift from God. To give or to take, and there is no precedent in the scriptures for such a request. Besides that, the devil is needed in his job for which he would be totally unfit if he got saved. There is precedent for household salvation, though. See Acts 11, verse 14, and Acts 18, verse 8. Paul and Silas offered this to the jailer. Acts 16, verse 31 says, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved, thou and thy house. They believed and were saved. Verse 34 continues, With all his house, having believed in God. Peter preached this too. Acts 2, verse 39 says, For to you is the promise, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call unto him. 
In Exodus 12, verse 3, the lamb was slain for a household. Unbelieving family members are sanctified by our faith. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14 says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified in the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified in the brother. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Some object that God would be unrighteous to choose some and not others. We are too late. He has done just that. Psalms 147 verse 19 says, He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his ordinances unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation, and as for his ordinances, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord. God did not attempt to share his first covenant with any of the world but Israel. The New Testament he shares only with spiritual Israel. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6 says, For thou art a people holy unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a people for his own possession, above all peoples that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all peoples. God is not worried about multitudes, for he has chosen the least. He still only chooses little spiritual Israel on the narrow road. Abraham is the father of spiritual Israel, the church, those who walk in the same gift of faith that Abraham walked in. Galatians 3 verse 7 says, Know therefore that they that are of faith, the same are sons of Abraham. Paul told the Gentile church at Rome that the people of all nations who believed the promise were Abraham's children. Romans 4 verse 16 says, For this cause it is of faith, that it may be according to grace, to the end that the promise may be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, meaning natural Israel, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, a father of many nations, meaning Gentiles, have I made thee. True spiritual Israel believes the promises even now. Romans 9 verses 6 through 9 says, For they are not all Israel that are of Israel, neither because they are Abraham's seed, naturally or physically, are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, it is not the children of the flesh, meaning natural Israel, that are children of God, but the children of the promise are reckoned for a seed. Those who believe the promises are the born-again children of the promises. These are Abraham's seed. A New Testament spiritual Jew is circumcised in heart, not flesh. Romans 2 verse 28 says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, or physical, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, spiritual, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter. Notice that a Jew now is not a physical Jew. A Jew now has the flesh cut off from his heart through the new birth. Galatians 6 verse 15 says, For neither is circumcision in the flesh anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as shall walk by this rule, peace be upon them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. The Israel of God are they who walk as new creatures. The unregenerate physical Jews who worship in synagogues are not Jews until they are born again through the New Testament. Revelation 2 verse 9 says, I know thy tribulation and thy poverty, but thou art rich, and the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews, and they are not, but are a synagogue of Satan, the same in Revelation 3 verse 9. We were not Jews, but now are in spirit. Romans 9 verse 25 says, As he saith also in Hosea, I will call that my people which was not my people, and her beloved that was not beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called sons of the living God. We were not his people, but are now beloved sons of God. Romans 9 verse 27 says, And Isaiah crieth concerning Israel, natural or physical, If the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that shall be saved. A remnant of natural Israel will be born again mostly after the elect Gentiles have been saved. Romans 11 verse 25 says, A hardening in part hath befallen Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. In part here means that the line between Gentiles and Jews is not a sharp demarcation. Neither was it in the book of Acts. Jews are even now being saved more than ever. This is a sign that we are nearing the end of the times of the Gentiles. Most of the physical Jews will come in after the Gentiles. We who sought not after God were given the gift of faith to be spiritual New Testament Israel when natural Israel turned her back on God. Romans 10 verse 20 says, And Isaiah is very bold, and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. 
I became manifest unto them that asked not of me. God revealed himself to the church, who on their own neither knew him nor sought him. Verse 21 continues, But as to Israel he saith, All the day long did I spread out my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Romans 11 verse 7 says, That which Israel, physical, seeketh for, that he obtained not. But the election, chosen, obtained it, and the rest were hardened. We see here that only the few chosen among the many called of Israel accepted Christ in the New Testament. The rest were reprobated. Verse 8 continues, According as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this very day. In that day and in this, those who walk by faith are chosen from among the called to be the eternal people of the living God. Paul said all Israel is the physical Jews and Gentiles who are part of the olive tree by faith, not those who are broken off by unbelief. See Romans 11 verses 19 through 25. All have sinned and deserve destruction. Is God wrong for giving some mercy and grace and others justice? All deserve justice instead of unmerited favor. Sovereign God, For Us and Through Us by David Eels Chapter 7 God's Sovereignty Over Deception And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled in them that perish, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should not dawn upon them. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4 The God of this world is Satan, but he does not run this world. He is called the God of this world because this world worships and serves him whether they know it or not. Anyone who serves the lusts of their flesh worships and serves Satan as their God. He is the father of the flesh, which is also called the old man. God never gives Satan credit in the scriptures for being sovereign. Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Satan blinds the minds of the unbelievers so that they do not understand and see the light of the gospel. We can see from other scriptures that Satan received his authority from the Lord to blind the unbelievers. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says, Be sober, be watchful. Your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom withstand steadfast in your faith. We have the ability to withstand Satan when we walk by faith, but the word may here implies that he has permission to devour those who do not. With Christians or non-Christians, unbelief gives permission to Satan. The faith that resists and binds Satan is a gift from God. See Ephesians 2 verse 8. Satan has permission to devour those who do not have the gift. John 12 verse 35 says, Jesus therefore said unto them, Yet a little while is the light among you. Walk while ye have the light, that darkness overtake you not. Notice that word overtake. This indicates that darkness is chasing all of us. The Lord is saying that for a little while we are going to receive the light, but do something with that light while we have it, so that the darkness does not overtake us. And he that walketh in the darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have the light, believe, meaning trust in and act on, on the light, that ye may become sons of the light. If we do not act on the light now, the impression will leave us and the darkness will again close in. When we pass by the moment, we have been tried and failed if we have not done something with the light. These things spake Jesus, and he departed and hid himself from them. Jesus hides himself from those who do not value the light enough to act upon it. Verse 38 continues, That the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this cause they could not believe, for that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes, and he hardened their heart. Lest they should see with their eyes, and perceive with their heart, and should turn, and I should heal them. It is clear from the text of Isaiah 6 verses 9 and 10 quoted below, that the he who blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts is the Lord. Israel had the light for a long time, and they did not bear fruit of it. Many Christians have the light, but do not act on it. They start out in a blaze of glory, but soon the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, trials, and persecutions hardens their heart and allows the darkness to overcome them. See Matthew 13 verses 19 through 23. We must believe and walk in the light while we have it so that Jesus does not withdraw and hide himself. Isaiah 6 verse 8 says, 
And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Then he said, Go, and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, yet understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn again, and be healed. God is blinding eyes and hearts through the devil. God makes us responsible when we see his word to walk in the light of its truth. 1 John 1 verse 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanseth us from all sin. Walking in the light sanctifies us. God has a method for weeding the church which most do not understand. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 says, Let no man beguile you in any wise, for it will not be except the falling away come first. Verse 8 continues, And then shall be revealed the lawless one, whom the Lord Jesus shall slay with the breath of his mouth, and bring to naught by the manifestation of his coming. Even he whose coming is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceit of unrighteousness for them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God sendeth them a working of error, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be judged who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. We see here that falling away comes through the deception of Satan. However, God is sending this working of error to those who do not love the truth, so that they might be judged. By the way, this letter is addressed to the church. Christians, using the term loosely, can fall away. There is a great falling away today, but an even greater deception is coming. Before God sends judgment, he sends a working of error to weed out the church. Who will believe a lie? It is the evil and wicked who will believe a lie. Proverbs 17 verse 4 says, An evildoer giveth heed to wicked lips, and a liar giveth ear to a mischievous tongue. Verse 11 says, An evil man seeketh only rebellion, therefore a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. The evildoer will be weeded out by deception. They are going to be seen clearly for who they are because they are going to buy the lie and fall away. The righteous love God's word and the truth and will not be deceived. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 19 says, For there must be also factions, which is the Greek word for heresies, among you, that they that are approved may be made manifest among you. It is necessary for heresies to be among us, so that they that are approved by God may be known. God is doing two things with deception and evil. He is revealing the wicked and revealing the true. This is God's method throughout history for separating his people from the tares. Birds of a feather flock together. God will gather the tares into bundles to burn them. Deception is one of God's methods for proving who will be counted worthy of the kingdom of heaven. Remember this working of Satan will come through power, signs, and lying wonders. These are placebos to pacify the church with replacements for the genuine to confirm the lies being taught. The genuine are listed as gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12 verses 4 through 11. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, healings, workings of miracles, prophecy, discernings of spirits, kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. For our own safety, we should obey Paul who said, Learn not to go beyond the things that are written. How so many people can believe that some... Join us next time for the continuation of this chapter in Sovereign God, For Us and Through Us by David Eels. For more information and materials, or to download and read Sovereign God for free, go to www.americaslastdays.com.